Now can you hear yes, us? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. And hopefully we're not okay. We've got a bit of an echo, so forgive us until we figure this stuff out. Everyone else needs to mute, right? Okay. So I'm going to get started and hopefully this will go smoothly. Um, thank you all for joining us. This is our first uh, seminar in Mari. Um, the goal of this is to start a process whereby we foster uh, relationships with academics and academic institutions, share knowledge and bring interesting talks uh, to Mari and enable us to interact with the wider research uh, world, especially in Africa. Um, today we have the privilege of having Nick Cheeseman. Uh, Nick is an old friend of mine. Um, Nick is a professor of uh, democracy at the University of Birmingham and was formerly Director of African Studies at the University of Oxford. Um, he mainly works on democracy and elections and development and has conducted research from a range of, uh, in a range of countries, uh, basically all over Africa and most of Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, the least, um, you do call it, um, the, the, the only thing that I can say about him that is a dis disappointment is that he's a fan of Queen's Park Rangers if anybody knows who they are. So don't hold that against him. Um, he's going to talk to us about social media uh, in elections and the impact that it has, both in terms of informing people and misinforming people. This is an important topic for many reasons, not least we're coming up to elections in Kenya, but because this is how a wide variety of information is consumed. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Nick to talk to us about this and hopefully this will all work perfectly. Thank you, Mohammed. It's a real privilege to be here on your very first meeting. I like being your, your Maori version, that's great. Um, I'm going to hand this book around. So I don't work on technology specifically, but I do work on the politicization and manipulation of technology. And I'm probably best known for writing this book, How to Rig an Election, uh, which talks about election rigging strategies in lots of different countries and says a little bit about digital strategies. But today I'm going to focus on the digital because that's obviously the intersection between what I do and what you do. And I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to try and talk about what does the information environment look like in Kenya? What does the digital environment look like? Where are people getting their news from? Where do they trust? Where do they not trust? Then I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what that means for democracy. Does that mean social media, new platforms, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter are strengthening or are they diluting or challenging our democracy? And as you would expect, I'm going to argue that there are lots of positives and there are lots of negatives, but also significantly that these positives and negatives cannot be divided. Right? You can't get the positives without some of the negatives. You can't find a way of perfecting things because most of the strategies people will point to that would reduce the negatives, more government censorship, actually take away much of what it is that we value about social media. So these are inherent trade offs that we can't simply easily escape from. And I'll talk a little bit about what makes fake news credible. Now, when I do this, I'm talking about a research project that I've been doing with my colleagues down the bottom here. So Jonathan Fisher, Jamie Hitchin, uh, Idiot Hassan and Gabriel Lynch. I want to give them a quick shout out because they're very uh, involved in this research program. And we were some of the first people in the world to get the Facebook what to social media on politics and we used that to do a research project in Nigeria but I've also been researching Kenyan elections for the past five elections and as some of you will know I used to write a column in over the last 20 years as well as drawing a comparison to that Nigerian experience. So just to give you a very brief view, overview of where things look like in the political realm, how we talk about social media and new technology, in particular the platforms Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, we could talk about Telegram and others and the growing use of a plethora of different platforms in the Kenyan context. But the debate has gone something like this. What Diamond's called liberation technology. Technology was going to free up citizens, it was going to put pressure on governments, it was going to strengthen civil society. Technology would provide the missing link 
in many countries, enabling a fast track process of democratization in the same way that people. Well, they've been removed from the meeting. Then, of course, we get a second process in which there's a very different framework. We start having an analysis that says actually authoritarian media can be very effective. We see internet shutdowns in something like nine African countries so far. We see growing government censorship. And you don't have to censor people online. If you know where they live, you can go and actually arrest them in old school ways, right? So we see old school repression being used to silence digital dissent. And then we also see the growth of bots and trolls and the manipulation of media and social media. And many of you will know that there's many countries around Africa where governments employ hundreds of people to go online and look like citizens and produce information that is actually being funneled from state house. So the second kind of wave was an effect from happening. And then the third part of this process, which has come more recently, I think, is that we started to worry about the nature of content and the destabilizing nature of content. So we started to worry that the issue is not so much who controls the media, but that any kind of social media has the potential to exacerbate two things. One, the flow of fake news, but through the flow of fake news, the extent to which we are polarized, the divisions between us in society. So this is the kind of discussion we've had about the emergence of echo chambers, QAnon, people finding other people like them online and increasingly moving into more polarized positions. Now, what I want just to point out here is that this first wave of discussion was really about who controls technology. It was the government controlling technology, too much is bad, citizens controlling is good. So here the discussion was about how do we get technology into the right hands and reduce government censorship? The discussion here is different. The discussion here is it doesn't matter who controls the technology, almost anyone who controls the technology, the content can still be problematic because of hate speech, because of the risk of these messages causing unrest. Many of you will have followed what's happened with Facebook recently, where we've seen big accusations that Facebook, by underemploying efficient enumerators and by not translating key texts into Ethiopian languages, facilitated the spread of hate speech and hence potentially the spread of ethnic violence in Ethiopia as a result of exactly these processes. So this critique in some ways is more powerful because it actually suggests there's an inherent challenge here, not just a question of who controls the media. So I just wanted to give you that background, just to give you a sense of what social scientists are talking about in terms of this relationship. What I'd then like to do is talk to you about what does this look like in Kenya? So for many of you, this might be absolutely obvious, but for some of you, there might be some surprises. Let's see. If you have a question, if you want to raise a point, if there's anything that's not clear, feel free just to raise your hand at any point. The data that I'm about to show you all of this data comes from nationally representative surveys conducted in Kenya. So it's all nationally representative at the national level, and it's all done by organizations that I trust to collect the survey data. I can answer questions about the data itself in the Q&A if you like. Now, what I would like to start with is a really key point, that you often get asked to do a project on WhatsApp, a project on Twitter, a project on Facebook, or a project on mainstream media. And the key point that we always start with, right, is that these things cannot be divided from one another. Let's consider the trajectory of a news story in contemporary Kenya. It might emerge on WhatsApp in a discussion group somewhere in Kasumu. It might then be put online from WhatsApp onto Twitter. It might be picked up by a journalist in Nairobi from Twitter, put on Facebook. It might be taken from that Facebook account by another journalist and written up as a small article in something like the Star. It might then be read in the star by a community radio journalist in Kikuyu. It might then, from that radio journalist's description, be taken into another WhatsApp group, right? So we don't have demarcated platforms. We have an uh, intense social media ecosystem in which things flow into each other in ways that are so complex and so hard to predict. It can be very hard to work out on which platform something originated, who actually began it, 
but also which platform is the most important for actually communicating using information. So to try and get around this, we asked Kenyans. So we said, how often do you get your news from the following sources? Radio, television, print, newspapers, internet, social media. So the first thing you can see that's quite interesting here is roughly 50% of people are saying that they get news from the internet. That's lower than, radio, um, than some of the others. Um, also, never from the internet, which is higher than some of the others. Um, but a significant proportion of people are saying they get news from uh, the internet. Now, of course, when you're getting news from the internet, you could be getting news from a mainstream newspaper that you're accessing online. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting it from social media. But I really want to point this out to you. A majority of Kenyans say they never get news from the internet. That's quite a significant point, right? Because we focus so much on digital elections, on the danger of the campaign, on the importance of Facebook and Twitter. Perhaps in this election, William Ruto has focused on that more than any candidate in Kenya's history. And yet an absolute majority of Kenyan voters are saying we don't consider that we get any kind of critical news or information online. Now, we might think that that's slightly misleading. We might think that underestimates the extent to which people do. Might be a question here about exactly how to define news, but it's still significant that 50% of people are giving us that answer. So there we say, where do you think you get most of your information about politics from? And this is a big complicated table of lots of different things. So I just want you to, ooh, I just want you to focus here. By far the most people are telling us that the information that they think is important is coming from the TV. Then it's radio. So we're still in a situation, which many of us would expect, that actually analog or di in digital in terms of TV, forms of communication are seen by people to be more important than social media. Of social media platforms, people tell us that Facebook for them is much more important than WhatsApp and Twitter. And I think that's something that's really important to see. If you talk to candidates, if you talk to voters, consistently people will tell us that Facebook is much more important platform for political information. We should have this slide, but we seem to have. We should have this one. Oh, yes, yeah, come now. It's just, I think it's a bit of a delay. Yeah. Just to reinforce that point, this is how often people in Kenya tell us they use the internet. This was in 2019, so it's probably a couple of years out of date. But again, it's important that, you know, we do have a significant portion of people here saying that they use the internet every day, but as you would expect, it's significantly higher in urban areas and rural areas. And even in urban areas, a majority of Kenyans tell us they do not use the internet every day. So again, I think it's important for us to think about a fairly privileged class who takes internet access for granted, and there's a significant portion of Kenyans who are not online regularly. And this perhaps is the most important one. Again, it's very complicated, so I'm going to highlight some things for you in a minute. But this is basically how much do you trust these sources? And you can see politicians, newspapers, TV, radio, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter. And basically, the trust a lot one is the blue bar. So the blue bar is what people really trust. As you move towards here, you move towards distrust. So what you can see is, if we focus here, First of all, people are much more likely to trust TV and the radio, mainstream media, than they are any form of social media. Of the social media platforms that we have in Kenya, interestingly, people are slightly more likely to trust Twitter than they are to trust Facebook. So this is really important because sometimes people say to us, oh, we're so worried about the election, we're worried about fake news online as if Kenyans don't know that social media is dubious, as if people don't know that what they get on Facebook and WhatsApp on Twitter might be problematic. So one of the things I think we have to work out is how do we find a kind of path between the fact 
that consistently getting certain messages is likely to shape your perceptions in ways you might not even be conscious of, at the same time as the fact that Kenyans tell us actually we don't trust social media for news that much. We know that social media often carries misinformation and we evaluate news stories on that basis. Just to show you what it likes explicitly when it comes to WhatsApp, we did this a couple of years ago, so again, it will be a bit out of date, but you can see we split the sample by rural and urban. Urban areas, um, the vast majority of people on WhatsApp again, but rural areas, not so many people on WhatsApp. Now, again, this doesn't mean that the impact of WhatsApp is not greater than this makes it look, because of course, you only need to have one or two phones in a house or a village where many more people live and multiple people might be getting access. And again, the person with the WhatsApp might be reading it out on community radio and therefore it's heard by the entire village. So it doesn't mean that the penetration of the information is less, but it's important to again keep in mind, and this is something that comes up all the time when we talk to candidates, that they think the ground campaign and being present on the ground with people is what wins them elections. The social media campaign is the bit they increasingly have to do to compete with their rivals, but it's not where the election is won and lost. Finally, in Kenya, how often do you think people from the following groups spread information they know to be false? So we've got government officials, parties, news media, social media, activists. And this, the off yellow is often, so when people say yellow, they're saying a lot of the time these people are sharing misinformation. Blue is never. So if you get a high blue bar, they're saying these people never share misinformation. You can see that Kenyans have very low opinions of their politicians. Never is very low. Often is very high. They also have very low opinion of the information they get on social media and other people on social media. Never is very low. Often is very high. By contrast, traditional media has much higher levels of people saying it's never misleading and much lower levels of saying it's often misleading. So again, Kenyans have a strong sense of distrust in political leaders and strong sense of distrust in what they get on social media. So what do I think is happening right now when it comes to the immediate information around this election? And this is why I'd be really interested in your insights, because this is just coming from conversations we've had in the last two weeks. I think one of the things that's really important to say is that the key context here is the ICC prosecution of the alliance of the accused back when uh, in Kenya's history. Because it still seems to me that Kenyan political leaders are operating as if things said on social media can lead to prosecutions. Even though the prosecution of Ruto and Kenyatta fell apart, even though that high profile process led to the Jubilee Alliance forming and then taking power, I still think the message that what you say and being associated with hate speech and violence can cause trouble has still resonated within the political class. And of course, it's really important to remember that in the wake of that, it wasn't just Kenyatta and Ruto on trial, it was also people like Sang, it was journalists. And in the public media sort of interface, the media was also kind of put on trial. Senior editors and journalists were told that they had contributed to the violence by being willing to disseminate hate speech or not reporting appropriately on the conflict. And I think the ramification of that is felt today. So I think actually in Kenya, more so than in India, more so than in Brazil, more so than even in some parts of the United States, the main candidates are very careful about what they say online. If you go to the, and we've tracked the Twitter and Facebook of most of the senior politicians, they are banal. They're often dull. They're heavily choreographed. They say relatively straightforward things. Very occasionally you'll get someone saying something interesting. They'll very rarely say anything that's particularly controversial. They'll very rarely actually reply to comments. So there's very little interaction between others and these individuals. And what you get is a fairly straightforward set of what they want you to think about the campaign. If you find controversial messages, they will be typically made by A, more downstream candidates, and B, at rallies more than actually online itself. So we actually have an environment that in some ways looks much more clean, protected, non-hate speech, non-fake news at the national level than any of the other countries I mentioned, than the United States, than India, than Brazil. But that belies the fact that a lot of this is going on under the radar. 
right? But it's being hidden because of the prosecution risk from the ICC. And because we now have the NCIC and we have the other mechanisms that are in place. And people know that there are agencies actually looking at social media every day to detect fake news. So what's happening at the same time as that? Well, on the one hand, we have... Um, sorry, it's taking a moment to come through again. On the one hand, we have consultants and informal working groups that are currently being prepared to create attack ads and misinformation. Some of you will have seen the documentary about William Ruto that was circulated about four or five days ago with an American PhD student voice lecturing us about the democracy of Kenya and how certain people have been good for it and certain people have been bad for it. That message, for those who remember, looks and sounds a lot like the adverts that were targeted against Raila Odinga in previous elections. Many of those videos we now know were produced by Harris, an organization in the United States. So you've got the use of international consultants to produce slick kind of attack ads. They will stop short of hate speech. They will stop short of explicit fake news often because they want to be seen as being a bit more credible and they're related to companies that you could actually connect to and sue. So at the same time, we have increasing rumours that all of the main candidates are creating informal working groups. And what happens with these is that, of course, candidates don't want fake news or hate speech to be part of their official campaign. So instead of putting them in-house and making them part of the official campaign team, you will encourage often people you know to be influencers in certain areas or people within your teams who aren't actually directly employed by you to form a loose alliance to start producing messages ready for the campaign proper. And that creates plausible deniability. When those messages start to be produced, the candidates can say they didn't have anything to do with them, they didn't sanction them, they didn't pay for them. And if they can create that institutional uh, insulation, they can then escape prosecution. So one of the things that I expect to see happen, especially after April when we get the candidates confirmed and we start to move through the primaries to the election proper, is we will start to see this misinformation increase. We will start to see the attack ads increase, but they will not be circulated by Kenyatta and Ruto and Odinga directly. They will be circulated by other individuals who will go then through the relative bots that they know are most effective, the, uh, the supporters they know are most effective, and they will be circulated much more informally in a way that it's harder to connect them to specific campaign teams. We also have talked to a lot of people who have discussed with us the fact that we see, as we have in many elections in Kenya, the growth of ethnic WhatsApp groups. So WhatsApp groups where you only add people to the WhatsApp group if you know they're the same ethnicity. And that some of these groups are, people have described them as kind of the crucible or the fulcrum of attack ads or misinformation. That in some of these you will start to get people putting together ideas, memes, pictures, sometimes just for jokes that then get forwarded and then end up at some point being put on Twitter and Facebook. Again, these are loosely aligned to the campaigns, but they're not directly employed by them. They're not mobilized by them effectively. At the same time, of course, you have local level individuals who are seeking to gain traction and notoriety. And those are people who are often putting stuff online that hasn't been in any way sanctioned from above, but they're trying to get traction and they're trying to get bored out and they're trying to get contracts effectively by gaining notoriety, by showing that they can produce something that's interesting, they're hoping to get co-opted. In other words, they're fishing for jobs. They're hoping that at some point they're going to be sucked into a campaign or given money. So far, in the Kenyan case, we see very little third-party manipulation. We don't see what happened in America, where a lot of the adverts that really impacted on the Trump-Clinton election came from Russia, came from Moldova, came from other countries in Europe, from troll factories, from people trying to generate messages simply to generate added income for themselves. We don't seem to have that external international effect. The thing that is really interesting to me so far is from the interviews we've done and that my colleagues have done, who I mentioned earlier, is that we have seen more and more and more focus on social media at the more grassroots level. So most of the governors that we're talking to now say they're spending more on social media than they did 2017, spent more then than they did 2013. And it's starting to get a bit more organized. And the reason it's starting to get a bit more organized is because there's a sense that actually you have to work quite hard at this to make it effective. And I think this is one of the things that we often forget. Making WhatsApp work for you politically is an extremely time intensive job. Right? Because WhatsApp is actually, if it's officially regulated, if you're not illegally farming numbers, it's actually really hard to set up cascading WhatsApp groups to get a common message out to thousands of people at the same time. And Kenyan leaders typically have not done this so far. 
So what we typically see is that at the governor level, the MP level, the MCA level, somebody will try and identify an influencer within every ward, maybe an influencer within every polling station area that they can bring into the team and have helped them circulate information and messages. But this is not actually done at the kind of systematic level it's done elsewhere. So just to wrap up, and I'll stop in a minute, I'll talk a little bit about WhatsApp and what it looks like in other places, because I think it's really quite different to what we see here. So we need to talk about WhatsApp. Why do we need to talk about WhatsApp? As you all know, it's the most popular messaging app right now. So that's just say app, not act, in over 40 African countries. Um, I think it's true that fear of prosecution in the ICC, as I said, has pushed a higher proportion of fake news uh, to WhatsApp and Telegram in the Kenyan context than we might see in certain other African countries. So that makes it particularly relevant. Um, and of course, these are the platforms we know least about. NCIC is tracking social media, it's tracking Facebook, it's tracking Twitter, can't track WhatsApp. International researchers can't track WhatsApp. International donors can't track WhatsApp. This is the big black hole, right? But we don't know what's going on. Just to say where we end up overall, just to give you the headline, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Nigeria and be quiet. And we argue that, you know, in the paper that we published in the Journal of Democracy, that WhatsApp is a disruptive technology. So in the context of elections, we describe it as a disruptive technology. Disruptive for good, in that it can challenge existing hierarchies. So we find countries where WhatsApp has brought women into the campaign discussion because women can anonymously engage in debates in WhatsApp in ways that make them feel more protected. Often brings in younger people into election campaigns because younger people are more effective at creating memes and being online and therefore they get an elevated position in campaigns that they wouldn't have had before the emergence of new technology, but also disruptive in that, of course, it's the hardest thing for us to track and it's the easiest way to circulate fake news, disinformation and, of course, hate speech. So we wrote a paper based on research in Nigeria and we were in particular in two parts of Nigeria, Kano and Oyo State. So just to say that if you want to have a look at the paper, it's available online for free. And to say, that, of course, we're not talking about the whole of Nigeria, such a big country, you can't cover it. But we did particular field work in these two areas. And what did we find about how politicians used WhatsApp? The interesting thing is that everybody told us how hard it was to use WhatsApp, that they tried to use WhatsApp, but they'd struggle to get messages out. They put what messages out on WhatsApp networks, but they were finding that people weren't resonating with them. People weren't sharing them. In general, they weren't actually being passed on. And in most places, it turned out that actually the most effective use of WhatsApp was coming from when people had pre-existing institutions. In other words, there was a place that we found that was work working really well, where one of the local candidates had co-opted somebody who ran the social media for the local university, someone who ran the social media for the local church, someone else who ran social media for a trade union, and put those people in a common WhatsApp group pushing messages to them. They would then push messages to those groups, and in that way they could reach thousands of people. But their ability to do that depended on there already being institutions that actually physically existed. They weren't actually able to do this simply online. And again, as I said earlier, everybody told us that WhatsApp was important to their campaign, but it wasn't actually what enabled them to win. So, what do people say in Nigeria about how they use WhatsApp? This is just a graph that shows us uh, the number of WhatsApp groups that respondents were members of. So we did a survey of hundreds of Nigerians and we asked them, how many WhatsApp groups are you members of? And we got quite a significant proportion saying 30 above, saying, saying 20 above, some saying 10 to 20. But actually the majority of people only saying they were members of five to 10 WhatsApp groups, which might surprise Kenyans because I feel like Kenyans are often on more like 30 and above. I'm on like 30 Kenyan WhatsApp groups, so I feel like we're, we're down this end of the spectrum. And then we also asked them, in the WhatsApp groups that you're members of, how many people are also in that group? So 27% of people said there were less than 50 people in the group. 73% said 50 or more. So most of these are large WhatsApp groups where people do not actually know everybody else on the WhatsApp group, and they've been set up for some other purpose. These aren't just family WhatsApp group or friends WhatsApp groups. And of course, that's what creates the potential on WhatsApp to cascade messages really quickly, right, from one message to another. But the candidates in Nigeria found it quite hard to do that. So ahead of the last election, they decided that they were going to change it. So the Bahari New Media Center was set up 
by supporters of President Buhari to change the use of WhatsApp in Nigeria. And they did two things. One, they launched a campaign to get people to put phone numbers in online so that those phone numbers could then be put in WhatsApp groups and messages sent to those WhatsApp groups automatically. But they also set up an infrastructure system for creating WhatsApp groups at every level of the country. So you've got a national secretariat that creates a strategy. Nigeria is divided into 36 states, like Kenya's 47 counties. Each one of those has a social media team managing it. Underneath those, you have local government areas. Each one of those has a social media team managing it. And then when you move to the local level, again, so you actually create a cascading system from the national to the local level with thousands of people employed in managing social media and creating and managing WhatsApp group at multiple levels. So that if a message is sent from here, it can cascade to the grassroots really quickly. And a message can also go back the other way, warning the campaign about what's being circulated locally about the candidate and so on. <laughs> as far as I know, nothing in Kenya has been done that's on this systematic level to create a capacity for campaigns to talk to thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people at the same time at the push of a button. And so I think in a sense, interestingly, Kenya's social media platforms still seem relatively fluid and disorganized compared to what's happening in the Nigerian space. But if anyone has evidence of much more organized WhatsApp structures in this kind of sense, do let me know. Final thing, of course, is to talk a little bit about when WhatsApp works, and I'll shut up very quickly now. When does fake news work? We've already said that Kenyans are very suspicious about most of the media they get. They don't necessarily believe everything. On the other hand, we know that fake news stories get traction and are widely circulated. There was a story, I think it was last January, I don't know if you saw it, that there was a picture of a vehicle that had gone through a series of barriers and was on fire. And the fake news story was that this vehicle had been burnt by a particular ethnic group because the driver was a member of a different ethnic group and that they'd have been burnt on fire and this was a sign of ethnic tensions rising. In reality, the driver had hit a power cable, the power cable had set the truck on fire and he'd driven into the water to try and put the fire out. But this is an example of the fake news that can gain traction because it resonates, right? It's not something that's come out of nowhere. People have a memory of 2007 and that creates a context in which that message works. And this is what we found. We generally found fake news stories are largely dismissed. So if you go online, you will see there's a couple of occasions when senior candidates have tried to claim massive attendance at their rallies. And Kenyans have almost immediately reverse image tracked the photos and shown that those were photos of religious gatherings, sometimes in other countries, and embarrassed the person into taking the photo down and apologizing. So you have a vigilant community that's paying attention to fake news and countering it. But the danger is when that fake news is assumed to be true because people assume the story is true. So just to give you an example, this was the most famous story in Nigeria ahead of the last election. And the story was that President Buhari was dead. Right? Not only was he dead, but he had been replaced with a clone from Sudan. Not even Nigeria, interesting, a clone from Sudan. Right? Now, this was the number one shared message on WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook. Why was it shared? We suggest there's three reasons. One, it was fun, right? It's kind of amusing. The Nigerians have an amazing political sense of humor, much like Kenyans, so this is funny. But two, it's not as crazy as it sounds, because when President Yoadjua was in office, he was very sick. He went out of the country. People in Nigeria didn't know where he was. There were demands for information. The government told everyone he was okay. Turns out he was dead. Why did the government do it? Presumably because the political elite wanted time to decide how the transition was going to work and so suppress the information of his illness and the state of his health until they felt they got that in control. So for Nigerians in 2017-18 to hear a story about a president who's much sicker than he's supposed to be or who might be dead, especially when Bahari had had ill health and left the country the treatment actually resonated with a popular memory. And as many Nigerians said to us, our government lies to us every day about policing, security, corruption. Why wouldn't they lie to us about this? So I think the, the message that we want to communicate there is that the most dangerous rumors and misinformation 
are the ones that contain an element of truth. We found in most of our surveys that photos and videos are about 30 to 40 percent more effective at persuading people than text because they also do the same thing, right? It's much more plausible if you've got a photo that's taken out of context or a photo that you've manipulated but in a very credible way, it adds that. But they're only really effective when they resonate. So the big risk heading into this election in some ways for Kenyans is not, as I said, that the main candidates are necessarily themselves going to push fake news directly because they have an incentive not to do so. And it's not that Kenyans will not be critically engaged the whole time in the kind of material on Twitter and Facebook. It's more that people in these informal networks will start to circulate messages that will resonate with people because they will remind people of what has happened in the past. Those will be the most problematic messages for us into 2020. Okay, I've talked for too long, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Um, we've got some questions on the um, chat. Uh, thank you, Nick. This has been really, really interesting. Um, My pleasure. There's a, a fair bit of debate going on as well in the chat. Um, we're just going to try to set it up so that people outside can um, ask questions directly. Otherwise, I'm going to read out questions. Um, and then we're all going to sign up for a course on how to use this media system. OK. Um, does anybody, first of all, want to start by asking a question? Um, if you can introduce yourself briefly. And... Hi, I'm Nita. Nice so, um, from what you've said, um, it sounds that Kenyans want to use our social media as much as listen to TV mm. you know, or podcast. But I'm wondering how many journalists in all these big networks actually get their sources from social media? Mm -hmm. We assume, obviously, that you do a bit of you know, some mm. social media. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether, as much as you know, Kenyans don't trust fake media in social media, I mean fake news, they still might consume it indirectly. But I think that's, that's definitely a big risk, right? Um, I think the other big risk is that there's a sense within a lot of people that the mainstream media doesn't tell you everything because people know that there's pressure on the media, right? So many of you will have seen the controversy over the front page of the nation a few days ago which many people felt confirmed that the nation was leaning towards one side rather than another. So as soon as you get to that stage, you have this interesting combination where people trust that kind of media more than other kinds of media, but they still feel that certain things are not going to be said in that context. And then they feel that perhaps that's where you get the social media information, right? And I think that's a really important point, that the worse quality your mainstream national traditional media the more people will go because there'll be a vacuum to look at social media. In terms of journalists you know, using that kind of material, I think that's true, it's a big risk. And you certainly see it, I would say, with the less reputable newspapers and the less reputable sources, where journalists are desperate for something interesting, they get a fake news story, they maybe call one person or two people rather than actually going and investigating it. And then you've got the risk of that fake news story actually being carried in the mainstream media. And of course, we've seen this not just here, you know, there have been many cases in the past where people have been sort of announced to have died on Twitter or Facebook and journalists have been tricked into carrying that as mainstream news. And it's then turned out that that was initially a fake news story all along. So I think you're absolutely right. And I think it goes back to that key point that we really need to think more about this as an ecosystem of information that is constantly flowing between different platforms rather than these are segmented. Because it's also true, right? that who's actually sharing information in the WhatsApp group? Some of those people are also going to be journalists, right? So, you know, clearly demarcating these things is actually much more difficult when you actually start to go and do interviews with people. So I think you're absolutely right. I have a, an interesting question here from uh, Felix Guzera. Uh, Felix, do you want to ask your question or should I read it? Um, I kind of asked a lot of questions, and I'm not sure which one you're referring to, Mohammed. No, we're not coming at this speakers. <laughs> which one were, was it? The the first one? Yes, actually, you've asked several, so you go with your favorite. Um, so I think I'll, I'll go with the one for the religious leaders one. So in one of the slides, you had you had highlighted how um, religious re uh, leaders were perceived as credible 
uh, sources of news. Um, so I'm curious where whether there was like a follow up or any kind of way to figure out where they got their information. So was there like a um, almost like a chain of where they got the information and thus then propagated even more misinformation? So is, is that this slide where we have religious leaders here and there's a yeah. lot of trust? Um, yeah, I think is so. Is it that one? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 this one. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because on this slide, you can see that there's a lot of trust in religious leaders, much more than political leaders. Yeah. But it's also true that when we had the 2010 constitution vote, if you look at the breakdown of votes and the position of the religious institutions, you could argue that people in 2010 voted much more with their ethnic communities than they did with their religious leaders, right? So you've got an interesting kind of tension here about the way in which people talk about who they respect and the information they respect the most and how people actually behave when it comes to their political you know, constituencies. We've never seen a religious leader stand on a religious ticket and win millions of votes in Kenya, but we have seen that when it comes to ethno-religious leaders. My sense here is that people think that religious leaders are less likely to mislead them because they still have a sense that religious leaders have a greater authority and a greater legitimacy and a greater concern for what is true. And that that's what's kind of shining through here. But it's an interesting question about what religious leaders are actually saying about the political news, right? Because in some cases we get religious leaders that try and stay very neutral. They try to inform their communities. They provide information about elections. In other cases, we've actually seen religious leaders who have tried to campaign and actually stand in elections themselves, right? We've seen the politicization of religion. And around 2007, we also saw the politicization around religious leaders before and after the election campaign. So my sense is that what this is really telling us is that Kenyans you know, believe that their religious leaders are more politically neutral than others, are more likely to tell them the truth than others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have that much political authority. A final interesting point here is just to note traditional leaders. Traditional leaders are much less likely to be seen as trustworthy than religious leaders, which is an interesting feature. It's the other way around in some African countries, but here uh, traditional leaders are seen by quite a number of Kenyans to actually be quite unreliable. In fact, traditional leaders have similar levels of trust as Twitter which is quite an interesting thing to think about and again reflects the politicization of some of these roles over the last 20 30 years so follow up on that nick so how much overlap would you say then is sorry that... i think we've got a follow-up shout oh. really loud oh, can you hear me yeah but really loud so people in the room might be able to hear you oh um okay so just to follow up on on how you've just answered. So, how mm -hmm. much overlap do you think is there with um, religious with ethno religious leaders um, and their influence on how vote um, their cons their followers or constituency would uh, be affected in how they will vote? I mean, my so the the question was about ethno religious leaders and their capacity to mobilize people to vote. Um, I mean, I think it very much depends where we are, right? So I think the certain parts of the country where we all know people are likely to vote a certain way. Um, and in those areas, we see religious leaders telling people often or encouraging them to vote a certain way. But they're probably going to vote that way anyway. Um, you know, Nianza is going to vote for Rilo at this election, right? If religious leaders stand up and tell people to, it's not necessarily going to make that much more difference to what would happen anyway. I think there are other parts of the country when you're preaching to multi-ethnic flocks, when taking such an explicit stance could actually be quite controversial and cause divisions within your own religious community. So mm -hmm. I think one of the things we have to point out here again is that Kenya is radically different in different parts of the country, right? Nairobi is cosmopolitan, multi-religious, most people are online. It's a very different picture if we move to certain rural areas, if we talk about Western is different, if we talk about the coast is different, if we talk about Northeastern is different. So I think one of the things we also have to be wary of, and I've talked about Kenya today just because I didn't have that much time, but the big caveat should be each place has a very different dynamic, right? When it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to religion, we could talk about places like Western, which has often divided its vote between different communities and other parts of the country that have tended to be more united in their vote. So I think when we get to that question, we need to go, 
below the national level, and I probably don't have time for that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, Thank thanks. you. What a great presentation. Thank you very much. Ah, excellent point. So we have a fantastic interjection from the floor with a brilliant point, which is if you look at the slide I showed you with where people say they get their information about politics from, relatively few people say religious leaders. Now, we could probably imagine that it's not that their religious leaders have never said anything about politics, but the way they might be interpreting this question is, where do you get the news that really matters to you? So it could be that what people are telling us here is they don't really see religious leaders as the most relevant people to tell them information about politics. So it's a great point. There's a sort of tension here between the answers to this question and the answer to the other. They might trust religious leaders more, but they're not necessarily seeing them as the authorities on news. And of course, that's also because people are thinking here also about news in different ways. So this question is also tapping, you know, everyday news, right? People are reading the newspapers. They're not necessarily seeing their religious leaders so often. If I can butt in. Sure. There's uh, several questions on the thread, which are about the causal relationships that you're identifying between misinformation, suppression, and the ability of information. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting because often we look at correlations as opposed to causation. Mm. And I'm interested if you can comment on that, specifically uh, from the perspective of going from information to acting information. Mm. That's sort of aspect. Yeah. So there have been a number of studies done. So the, the work that we've done struggles to get at causation, right? Because what you really want for causation is you want some kind of controlled experiment where you can reveal information to people and see how it affects their preferences and then see how it affects their behaviors. And it's impossible for us to do that with real-time social media because people are being bombarded with different kinds of information. We don't know where all of that information is coming from. And of course, it's very hard to track exactly how that impacts on their perceptions and how that acts, impacts on their actions. There have been a couple of studies published in the last three or four years. One was looking at India. I think another one was published looking at a country in Latin America, which have tried to get a handle on this. So what they've basically done is two things. One study I read basically showed revealing certain kinds of misleading information to individuals and seeing how often their perceptions were shaped by that. Another one, actually looked at providing fact checking. So it looked at what would happen if you got a piece of misinformation and then someone in the group that you were in said, I'm not sure that's true, right? So first of all, you've got the reveal of the misinformation, then you've got the intervention of someone saying, I'm not sure that's true. Both of the studies that I saw suggested that the fake news messages did have an inability to shape people's perceptions. So there was a statistically significant effect on perceptions. They weren't able to comment on behavior because they were looking at surveys. They weren't asking people to play a game afterwards or do a real world activity that would allow you to go from what you believe or what you perceive to the actual outcome. And they found interestingly that the existence of somebody in the group who pushed back was significant and it didn't matter that much whether that person was an authority figure or a normal person. So they trialed simple messages where somebody in the group would say, I don't think that's true. And then they trialed a doctor or a professor saying, I don't think that's true. And they actually found that the psychological effect was pretty similar between an average WhatsApp group member saying it and a professor or a doctor saying it. So there's some evidence there that fake news does shift perceptions. There's some evidence that you can fight that by having admins, et cetera, who challenge things or having groups of diverse views that will challenge things that reduces the perception. But it's very hard to track what this does when it comes to voting, right? Because, of course, we can't actually tell exactly how that individual voted and whether they changed their vote. And my suspicion in a lot of these cases is that fake news and disinformation isn't necessarily changing how you would vote. You know, for example, we have if you look at the latest survey, we have about 20% of Kenyans who tell us that they don't know who they're going to vote for the next election. My bet would be that fake news is unlikely to shape how the 80% who've already decided is going to vote. Those people have already made up their mind and it would take a pretty big, consistent fake news campaign 
to shift the perception of a committed Odinga supporter to become a committed Hutu supporter at this stage? So I think, again, this is a really interesting question. When we worry about fake news shaping how people vote, who are we worried about? Are we worried about the undecideds or are we worried about the hardcore? And again, when it comes to violence, if we're worried about fake news and misinformation generating violence, who are we really worried about? Because 99% of Kenyans have never taken part in violence and will never take part in violence. Are we really worried about it impacting on those people who might already be engaged in that kind of activity? So again, I think we need to become much more sophisticated and careful about how we talk about the impact of disinformation and who it has the most impact on, if that makes sense. I'm going to run out of time, but I'm going to uh, ask uh, George Green, uh, Mambelo, I'm sorry to butcher your name. Um, you've had your hand up for a while, if you could possibly ask the last question. And if you can speak up so that we yeah. can hear you. Okay, thank you. I don't know who's speaking, so I can't say a name. But uh, the question is, uh, do you have any insights into the flow of information? Like, uh, where does this information flow from? Is it that uh, urban areas uh, where this from information is generated, then it flows into rural areas? Or is it the vice versa, where some information comes from rural areas and then it makes its way into urban areas? Great. So the question was, where does misinformation come from? Does it come from urban areas and go into rural? Does it come from rural and go into urban? I think the answer is it's both. You know, in the case that I shared um, of the truck that was on fire that was said to have been uh, burnt deliberately, I think that was more information that came from outside of Nairobi and then into Nairobi. So it was more rural urban dimension. Um, but we also have obviously a lot of the groups and the organizations and the informal groups that I've been talking about being set up to share attack ads and disinformation during the campaign are more urban based and are more Nairobi based. So I think we'll see both of those things. And of course, in some ways, the greatest power of disinformation is for those people who is on, those people who are not present in a certain location, right? So if you're in Nairobi and something happens in Eldoret, you don't know what's happened in Eldoret. You don't know whether there was violence or not. You don't know whether someone said something or not at a rally. You weren't there. You're getting the messages. And so the most effective form of disinformation in the campaign will be to tell people who are not in an area that a certain atrocity happened here, that a certain candidate said something here, because that's hardest to falsify. For those of you who are in Nairobi, you know it's not going to be the case. So in some ways, the fake news in rural areas will be most effective when it's about Nairobi and vice versa. Now, of course, that's all moderated by the fact that we have consistent networks between urban and rural areas, right? Many WhatsApp groups will feature people in urban and rural areas at the same time. Twitter and Facebook connect urban and rural areas, as does remittance and travel and all sorts of other networks that mean that there isn't simply an urban-rural divide, as you all know. But I think it is nonetheless true that that's the danger for the election, that you get messages created in one area that are going to be probably most effective for people who might not actually be in that area itself. That's where, of course, having multiple people in WhatsApp groups is useful, because then you can contest that information and challenge that information. And it's where creating those balkanized WhatsApp groups that only have people from certain parts of the country or who are from certain political perspectives is the most dangerous, exactly in the same way as it was in the United States, if you look at the build up to the attack on the Capitol. Uh, thank you. On that note, this has been really interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, we're going to share the presentation, and there's a, a lot of questions in the chat that um, I'll post to Nick and uh, hopefully we'll get some answers. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to email your questions as well if you want to continue the discussion. If you'd like the PowerPoint slides and the graphs, feel free to email as well. And finally, just to thank Nick, uh, he accepted this very well. So thank you for giving us a talk. It's really been Pleasure. interesting. Thank you. Let's end it there. Thank you. Thank you.